Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, being so sunny outside and the temperatures are warmer, I basically, uh, it's very nice of you to be here. And clearly in support of Mark Asher uh, on his behalf, I thank you for that. Um, you know, I'm, my name is Antonio Tepeda Benito. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And, and I welcome you to the last full professor lecture of the spring semester. John just reminded me that this is what this was. I've been known to confuse this with <laughs> another event. Uh, the College of Arts and Science has initiated these lectures as a way of acknowledging and recognizing uh, the promotion of faculty to the highest rank in the university. There is uh, a huge amount of work and effort that goes into uh, becoming a full professor. And so I think it's, it's a great idea to have mm -hmm. the opportunity to be here and uh, learn mm -hmm. from, from the masters. And, and today we have uh, that opportunity with Mark Asher. I did a start another type of um, tradition, and that is that my remarks will be short and then there will be a colleague or somebody who has known Mark for a longer time to uh, also have the opportunity to share the bragging rights with me. And, and I do that because, um, you know, deans, provost, presidents, and so forth always uh, are the ones who take credit for, for the things that the faculty actually uh, do. And, and I want to make sure that, that a colleague is up here honoring Mark and, and mm. celebrating uh, his success. Uh, Mark uh, is professor and chair of the classics department. He has taught at UVM since 2000 and is an undergraduate alumnus. In addition to academic books and articles on Greek and Latin literature, he has published three books of children, original poetry, and translations and two opera libretti. So he's uh, <laughs> quite a polyvalent man who, uh, and he has other uh, gifts that uh, I'm amazed how he finds time, the time <laughs> and he has the talent to do everything and do it so well. Uh, so I'm gonna read a few remarks from students and colleagues uh, who are very eloquent and, and <laughs> capture very well um, who Mark is and, and the great person he is and why uh, uh, he's so liked and appreciated by all who know him. My greatest, this is a student talking, my greatest improvements as a, an undergraduate writer I owe to Mark, how Professor Asher can find time to operate a farm, produce a scholarship and children's books Chair of the department and still focus on each of his students is beyond my ability to comprehend. Personally, I don't think he sleeps. <laughs> so I'm just gonna ask the question, Mark, do you sleep? <laughs> Not enough. He doesn't sleep, all right. This student's smart, mm. and I guess that correctly. One colleague remarked, not only is Mark an outstanding teacher at all levels, he has achieved an exceptional level of integration of his research with his curricular offerings. Ever since he was an undergraduate student at UVM, Mark has displayed integrity, thirst for knowledge, and an ability to engage others in his many interests. So basically, um, I had the fortune to read his promotion and tenure dossier, and I can tell you that remarks like these were abundant and went on and on about uh, his ability. At a personal level, I can tell you that my interactions with Mark have always been incredibly uh, rewarding and he, uh, for the faculty in the department and the students of the department, you couldn't have a, 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 a greatest advocate for what you stand for and what you hope to achieve. So if any further uh, ado, I wanna, now introduce David Jenneman, who is an associate professor of English and co-director of the Humanities Center, who will tell us a bit more about Mark and his accomplishments. But um, 
Thank you. Thanks, Antonio. Uh, Mark, congratulations, first of all. As, as you guys will clearly hear, I am, have lost <laughs> my voice. Uh, and so I prepared about an hour's worth of material, but uh, I'm just going to have to keep it short. Um, uh, <clears throat> Mark's farm, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, is called Works and Days Farm. Uh, and the, the name comes from the long poem uh, by the Greek writer Hesiod uh, about a farmer and his brother. Uh, and at the beginning of the poem, the, uh, the, the, the protagonist uh, sort of describes the creation of the earth and Zeus's creation of the, the uh, five ages of, of humanity. Uh, and in the first few ages, things are pretty good. Uh, you know, you have, you have heroes and, and people with great nobility, but in the age that we unfortunately live in, um, things aren't so good. And, and, and uh, Hesiod says that the sort of defining characteristic of, of that period is that envy, foul-mouthed, delighting in evil, with scowling face, will go along with wretched men, one and all. And that really, that really uh, took me, uh, because whenever I think of Mark, I, I feel nothing but envy. Uh, just, just boiling, green-eyed envy. Uh, I look at his CV, and I am jealous that he publishes both in, uh, in, in an academic context very successfully, but he's also written children's books and graphic novels. I am astonished that he writes librettos, libretti for, for, uh, for operas. Um, he has published an article uh, just recently on one of my favorite filmmakers, uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini. I teach in the film and television studies department. I don't have the guts to write about Pasolini. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when I get invited to do an event like this, I feel compelled to put on a coat and tie. When Mark gets to do an event like this, he gets to wear a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> right? Mark and I each have three children. His are grown. That's reason for envy enough. Mark has, Mark has three grown children, and he looks like he's 25. I have three little children, and I look like I'm 65. <laughs> actually the reverse. Uh, Mark, despite looking like he could be anywhere between 25 and 40, is actually 78 years old. <laughs> uh, and I am 22. Uh, uh, but the more I, uh, the more I, I uh, uh, think about Mark, uh, you know, the more I am uh, overcome uh, with a need to transform envy into something else, which is admiration. Uh, I have spent uh, the last few years uh, uh, working closely with Mark, both uh, because Mark was one of my predecessors as the director of the Humanity Center and has been uh, a remarkable and, and sage counsel for how to approach the humanities and celebrate the humanities at the university and in the community, and he's a living example of, of the way the humanities impacts not just what we do here, but the world around us and, and our living and breathing communities. Uh, as a, a teacher, uh, I value uh, his, his insights, uh, his style, his thoughtfulness. We've talked together uh, in the Honors College first year seminar, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch back into Envy again. Uh, we, we got to suggest a film to teach in the Honors College, uh, and, and you know I teach film and television, that's my thing, and, and, and I, of course, took the opportunity to do something really fun and exciting for the students and decided to assign a Danish documentary about avant-garde <laughs> filmmakers who are battling with each other over theoretical issues. And Mark <laughs> chose an animated film. <laughs> so, so, you know, at every stage, uh, Mark, Mark demonstrates uh, both the, the, the seriousness of what we do, the importance of what we do, but also the joy of what we do. Uh, and so as I think about Mark and, and congratulate him as he uh, is elevated to the full professor, um, I am also uh, overcome with admiration for, for what he does. Uh, and in keeping with Hesiod uh, and the works and days, I'm reminded that, that um, uh, admiration is what's going to let us still continue to hang out with all of those noble people from the great generations, of which Mark certainly is one. And so Mark, congratulations, and thank you very much for your inspiration. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man, I'm not a man.
Uh, thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Dave. Um, I don't deserve all that, but I'm happy to have received it, and I'm very happy to be here and happy to see so many people here. Uh, friends from my neighborhood, um, family members, my father, David, my lovely wife, Caroline, is here. Um, as Antonio mentioned, I'm an undergraduate alumnus from this fine institution. Um, and so I have teachers to thank too, and I'm just like scouring the audience like right now. I tried to do it before. See if I've had any of you. Ann Clark said she might be here. Is she here? Ann Clark. I owe Ann Clark a great debt. She was my teacher. It's not because Ann is very old. It's because I was a non-traditional student when I was here. So um, Ann was one of my teachers. Uh, Bill Mears, did I see you lurking about? Bill Mears um, is one of my teachers uh, from art history and classics, and uh, I owe you a debt of, great, uh, debt of gratitude as well for being here. Um, let's see, anybody else? Well, primus inter pares amongst my teachers that I'm grateful to and will always be grateful to is the man, I have the pointer here, I don't know if it'll point back to you, um, Phil Ambrose, um, Ambrosius Maeus, was my uh, great teacher and got me inspired to want to pursue this path in the first place. So I'm very, very grateful uh, in, indeed. Um, okay, uh, this is only the second, this is only the second PowerPoint I've ever done. The first one was for my um, Dean's lecture. So uh, bear with me, I think I can make this all work. I have the mouse, the mouse looks like it's on or is it on, does it need to be on? Okay, I just need to, the mouse for one thing. Oh no, this mouse works. Okay, great, I got that. All right, so I thought a lot about what to talk about. Um, uh, and what you're gonna hear today is very provisional. It's uh, something I've been thinking about only for a couple of months. Um, I had thought I would try to rest on my laurels or advertise other projects I'm working on, irons I have in the fire. Here is one of them, but I couldn't resist. Um, uh, giving you a sample of what this, this piece is. This is the opera that I'm in the midst of writing the libretto for, compiling um, the libretto from Greek and Latin texts and um, writing interstitial dialogue in English on the topic of the great emperor, not so great emperor, uh, Nero. Um, and here is the, the piece, and here's a sample from it. your heart out. That was up. Uh, Nero singing to Papaya, a love duet borrowed from Virgil's Georgics. Very, very touching and moving. And now for something completely different, uh, a very small sample from this. That is the Sibyl, her eyes rolling in her head just a sample from Sybil's prophecy, uh, uh, announcing Nero's eventual downfall, uh, the culmination of the, of the first scene. What you heard there was the uh, singer singing uh, Sprechstimme, which is a form of, I guess I want to call it like operatic scat singing, where what's written in the text is sort of ad-libbed as the, uh, as the uh, singer desires. I thought about talking about this. Um, this is another project. This is a collection of uh, poems uh, that I wrote, and criticism that I wrote, uh, translations also, and it's called The Sentences of Ernst Halb, uh, which is an inversion of the German Halb Ernst, um, and it's meant to be tongue-in-cheek. This is a, uh, will be published, about two-thirds complete, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to write the poems and then write the criticism on them, but that's part of the game. Uh, very much part of the game, and self-consciously so. I pretend not to be myself in both guises. Um, and it's poised kind of uh, aesthetically in between, somewhere between Dante's confessional, La Vita Nuova, and Nabokov's satirical pale fire, something like that. Uh, I think maybe uneasily poised between those two things. But um, that's been a lot of fun to work on, and, I, and I'll probably finish this first before I finish what you're about to hear we talk about, which is this, sustainability, complex systems, and the Greeks. 
Uh, again, I have just begun thinking about this, and so this is a risk for me, but I figured that this is what this profession is about, taking risks, and um, I'm going to try it out on you, and um, I'm going to listen to what you say afterwards, both you know, yay or nay. Uh, this project is an exercise in two things, um, and they're both part of the joys of being a classicist. You look around the world and you see familiar things all the time. Uh, familiar because they go back to antiquity. Um, I'm going to be careful here and not try to claim too much um, for the, the Greek legacy, uh, for both this notion of sustainability and complex systems, but this notion that the more things change or the more it changes, the more it stays the same, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, uh, a, a, a little uh, witticism that was uttered in the context of fashion, um, and, and the, the more round, full, let's just say biblical version, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. We'll revisit the sun again in a minute, just by happenstance as we, as we progress. So again, it's one of the things that I enjoy about being a classicist is seeing ideas reemerge um, all the time. It's also an exercise in this. Um, <laughs> uh, Steve Martin in The New Yorker from a few years back, um, that it's okay to be wrong and it's okay to uh, overclaim because you can calibrate it, you can come back, you can come back to uh, a reasonable uh, conclusion, reasonable argument, uh, reasonable position. So if something I say today strikes you as modestly unreasonable, um, that's okay, I've got Steve Martin on my side. Um, so what is sustainability? And notice it's in, in inverted commas, sustainability, what is it? Um, well, one thing I know for sure, as this chart definitively, definitively proves, the word sustainable is itself unsustainable in the English language. It crops up all the time. You see it in newspapers, you hear it all the time, people throw it around, politicians throw it around all the time. You know, what is sustainability? And as you see, let's see if I can use this pointer to work, by 2109, this is a joke, by the way, uh, by 2109, all sentences will just be the word sustainable repeated over and over again. So um, there you go. Complex Systems loves to put things in graphs and, and chart the, the, uh, the, the rate of growth <laughs> of things. And there you go. So that's courtesy of uh, xkct.com. So sustainability. Sustainability does have an origin. And again, as a classicist, I like, uh, we do as a, as, a, as a kind, like to go back to origins, to discover origins. Um, by my lights, um, from what I've read, from what I've been able to determine, um, the use of the word sustainable, the way we use it today, about the environment and about human interaction with the environment, um, stems from this, th from this. Um, 1968, the meeting of the club at Rome, club of Rome in 1968, um, some thinkers in terms of environmental uh, policy, some computer modelers funded by uh, a wealthy Italian businessman gathered in Rome in 1968 and, and talked about these things. Um, and um, the result of their, their work was this book in 1972. It's essentially the report of the club at Rome meeting in 1968 called The Limits to Growth. Um, the, the two key figures there are uh, the Meadows, Donella or Dana Meadows, and Dennis Meadows, her husband. Uh, Dennis Meadows was a, a computer scientist at MIT, and, and uh, Dana Meadows knew him there. She's the primary author of this, of this book, but um, this is one of the first, if not the first, uses of the word sustainable in the way we um, tend to think of it today. And there's their definition. Um, we are searching for a model output that represents a world system that is sustainable without sudden or uncontrollable collapse. And two, it's capable of satisfying the basic material requirements of all, all people. There's the word sustainable in, I'm colorblind, it's either red or green. Um, but uh, there's that. The Brandt Report of 1980 um, also um, spoke of sustainable biological environment and sustainable prosperity. Um, but in that report, um, Brandt warns about the, uh, 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 the persistent confusion of growth with development. So uh, this notion of sustainable development, which I think we're going to see on the next slide, yeah, the term sustainable development, an apparent oxymoron, um, but perhaps not, we could argue that, was coined um, in the, the Brundtland Commission's paper, Our Common Future. 
and just to paraphrase, paraphrase the way they define it, sustainable, sustainable development is defined as the kind of development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. As far as definitions go, I can take these. These, these work. These are workable definitions of sustainability. I'm not an expert in this field. There are probably refined different you know, variations on this theme depending on what angle you see sustainability from, whether it's economic, environmental, biological, uh, whatever you want to think. So the Greeks. Um, <clears throat> once upon a time, <laughs> way back when, um, uh, societies had myths, and, and myths preserved behaviors. Um, in the beginning was not the word, but in the beginning was the deed. That's uh, one particular take on myth, to paraphrase Faust. And in fact, uh, you know, Marx does this as well when he talks about uh, the, 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 the notion that behavior comes before the talk about behavior or dialogue about behavior. Anyway, um, in myths are preserved um, uh, uh, behaviors. One of the uh, important uh, behaviors that I wanted to talk about right now is this notion of um, the, the goddess who is the mistress of the animals, the, prote the protectress of nature, the protectress of the environment, the protectress of animals in particular. Um, and here's an example of this. This is a pot from about 680 from Boeotia. It's in the Archae National Archaeological Museum at Athens of the Potnia Theron. And that means in Greek, got to get this without, uh, the mistress of wild beasts, of the mistress of the animals. And here you see her. So actually, I love this picture. It's really great. Here she is. She's got a fish you know, between her legs. She's got you know, wild animals. Maybe they're wolves here. Maybe domesticated animal bull here. A whale here. Katos, probably, or some sort of fish. Uh, birds here. And you got the swastika symbol, ancient symbol, not of Nazism, but of you know, uh, prosperity, health, peace. Um, and a uh, very old concept, the very, a very old concept about a, a, a mother goddess uh, who, who controls nature. And um, here's another example of it. The uh, famous Diana of the Ephesians. If you are an enthusiast of the book of Acts or biblical literature at all, New Testament, um, she makes her appearance even there um, uh, when the Apostle Paul is, is um, with, uh, I think, Silas in Ephesus. Um, there's a big ruckus about the new, the new religion being introduced. But Diana of the Ephesians was worshipped from antiquity, long antiquity, in the area of Ephesus. And here's her image. Now, we often think of Diana as a live goddess, you know, uh, very skinny, girl-like, in a small tunic, prancing around, hunting in the, in the woods. Well, she, be she does become that. But she was once, indeed, and, and, and remains still throughout antiquity, simultaneously, the mistress of the animals, the protectress of of of, of nature. So you see her, oh, you see her, you know, multiple breasts here. You see uh, emblems of, of nature all, uh, all over her body, in her hair. Um, if you look up close, there's bees, there's acorns, all these, again, symbols of fertility. And here she is presiding over the beasts who have lost their heads, but there they are there. Here's a coin from the time of the, uh, from the time of, um, well, almost the time of the Apostle Paul. Um, the time of Claudius, Claudius and Agrippina on the front, and this image of Diana of Ephesus uh, on the back. So really a trajectory that persists um, for a long time um, in, the, in the ancient world of this idea of the mistress of the animals. And you know, the Greeks didn't invent it. It goes, it goes back. It's, it's prehistoric. It's Neolithic. It's, it's, it's widespread. Pretty much every culture has this. And there's the Venus of Willendorf. Um, tiny little thing, though, though it looks ginormous, little thing like that. That goes back to 30,000 BCE. So in the Greek world, we do get myths about this. Um, we get the myths of encroachment and violation. That is, people trespassing on the mistress's domain. Here's a famous um, uh, pot, it's actually a famous pot but from, from a famous myth of um, Actaeon. Actaeon is hunting with his dogs, and you see his dogs all around him here. I'll tell you what's about to happen. Most many of you will know this story already. But he errs, quite literally errs, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, wanders into the sacred precinct of this Diana figure or uh, uh, Artemis figure. Uh, in Greek, Artemis uh, in uh, Latin or Roman mythology, Diana. And um, he, he is punished for it. 
Now, Ovid's version of the story, which I'll show you in just a second, uh, it, 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 it develops it. It gives a, a motive and a reason and kind of causality. But the idea behind this um, it lies in the way Greek sanctuary structures were set up from, again, going back to the Bronze Age and, and even probably the Neolithic period, where a divinity would have carved out around its sanctuary, temple, wooden, stone, whatever, whatever period of history we're talking about, a sacred precinct where things were preserved. You don't mess with it. You, you preserve it to keep it. And you could think it's because it belongs to the deity and it you know, hands off, otherwise you're in trouble. But one, another anthropological reading of this is that it's a way to uh, build in a taboo into society, into uh, one society, that prevents one from taking too much. You can't take from there because that's, it's a limit. Uh, this idea of setting limits, um, again, in prehistoric, primitive thinking. So he wa wanders in there and he's punished for it and he's shot with arrows. You know, the story goes that you know, he saw her bathing nude in her pond attended by her maidens. This is a painting by Cranach much later. And then he's turned into a stag. So the human is reverted back to nature and then becomes subject to the cycle of nature. He's torn apart by his own dogs. You know, this, this tale becomes slightly moralized. In Ovid's version, which is really wonderful, it, it could in fact be autobiographical because Ovid, this is a sideline here, Ovid was exiled uh, for two things, Carmen at error. Error meaning he just wandered in the wrong place and probably saw something that he shouldn't have seen and then maybe wrote a, a poem about it, a Carmen about it. But uh, I don't want to make too much about that. But okay, uh, well, okay, self-indulgent poem I wrote. This is the, the thing about the Ovid passage, you can just read that yourself if you care to, is, is this business here, the way he depicts um, and again, he's inheriting this whole notion, and he's an artist, and he's a poet, and he's doing it consciously, but it, it, it's, a, it's a longstanding cultural uh, leftover. Um, you know, a, a, an ancient forest was standing that had been violated by, violated or, or, or harmed by no axe, and a cave in the middle of it, which was uh, overgrown with bushes and, and foliage. This, this notion of a pristine nature untouched by human hands uh, that's the way Ovid sets up this particular scene that um, Actaeon wanders into. Um, okay, an, another example of this encroachment, again, in, in, the, in sort of this mythic layer. All right, um, you probably uh, didn't know that one of the, one of the precipitatory uh, acts of the Trojan War and the problems of the Trojan War was a similar sort of encroachment involving Artemis, and, and that involves... Agamemnon, the king of uh, Argos, Mycenae, the head, the king of, of let's just say, all the Greeks uh, in, the, in the Trojan cycle. And so uh, this is a notice that, whoops, sorry. This is a notice that, um, okay, they're assembled for the, the, uh, the, the second time to go to Troy. Agamemnon killed the deer while hunting and claimed to surpass Artemis herself. In that statement right there, is, there is something latent there. This, this tendency to moralize these stories that were probably, again, I just say cultural taboos. You know, this is a very late rip, uh, uh, version of this story, and so it survived. So it's, you know, he's guilty because he claimed to be better than Artemis. But probably, originally, the whole idea of a temenos, that's the word that describes that area around the temple, from the word temno, which means to cut out from uh, everything else, it represents just this, this basic fact that you're not to trespass, you're not to overstep. Overstep is important. That's what over trespass means. So um, from this stems the fact that um, he has to sacrifice something of his own to appease Artemis. He sacrifices his daughter Iphigenia, uh, you know, a key building block in the whole Trojan story, the, the Trojan cycle, um, uh, the, probably the foundation stone of Aeschylus's Oresteia, his great trilogy about the homecoming of Agamemnon and later his subsequent murder by his wife, Clytemnestra. The point I'm trying to make here is that this is like encroachment and violation of, of uh, sacred space and space that is protected. Overstepping, human overstepping, is f fundamental to Western um, thought preserved here in myth. Here's a Roman wall painting of Iphigenia being sacrificed um, in place of the, you see the stag up there, some versions that, you know, I won't go into all the versions, but she's later substituted. She doesn't die in the end, but Aeschylus's version she does. Um, another thing you might not know um, is uh, there's another version 
of, there is a version or an account of the beginning of the Trojan War, the reason for the Trojan War, that you don't get from the Iliad because it's not there. It's part of the prequel to the whole cycle of epics that were the, that comprised the epic cycle, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey just being sort of a slice of that larger tradition. And it's in this poem called the Cyprium. Um, and here we have this, no, this explicit notion of Zeus um, contriving the Trojan War precisely because of overpopulation, that uh, the earth groans under the weight of all the human beings that are on it, and he acts and sets the, the Trojan War in motion. Um, I guess I couldn't let you out here without hearing some Greek, um, and I won't read the Cypria, the, Cypria the, the Greek from the Cypria. I'll read Homer's Iliad, and then I want to draw attention to this. Main in aeda tea. I can do the bouncing ball with this. Pele ado achilleos ulamenein he muria kai ois alge eteken polas dipti mus psukas aidi pro e absen hero on autus de heloria teuke kunesi oio noisi te passi dios de telea to bule. And you see here, you don't even have to know Greek to see that there is a, a direct correspondence between the version of the Cypria, you know, the incipit of the whole poem. Zeus's plan was fulfilled, um, and the echo of that in, in Homer's uh, Iliad. Cypria was, was probably composed as a poem after the Iliad, but it represents a tradition that is all part of a piece um, uh, going back. You see it um, in the biblical world. You see um, uh, the Tower of Babel is a, is a version of the same story. Uh, not the same story, but a similar story. Uh, human overreach. Uh, here it's, again, moralized, as we saw in that other example from um, uh, Proclus um, and Agamemnon killing the deer. He bragged to be equal to Artemis herself. Here it's, you know, they're trying to make a name for themselves, these human beings, so they must be put down by the gods. But this has also parallels in other Near Eastern literatures and also in the Indian Mahabharata, this idea of people getting too big, too much, and being pushed back down. <laughs> Another myth, I won't go too, too far with these, but um, Erisichthon, this is a, a similar myth. Uh, you probably don't know about it unless you've read Ovid. It, Ovid is the primary preserver of this, of this story. Uh, this illustration comes from UVM's special collections, um, Ovid collection, uh, the Prindle collection of Ovid by Solus. So uh, here Eris, Erisichthon, uh, a wicked tyrant king from I think Thrace, which is where all wild things come from in Greek mythology, chops down a tree, and that tree is sacred to Ceres, or Demeter. Demeter is the other name for Ceres, um, goddess of agriculture. Uh, you can see the votive hang offerings here. So as a result of that, a punishment for chopping down the sacred tree within the temenos, the sacred area of, of the goddess, um, that's not supposed to be violated, um, he's punished by uh, uh, perpetual hunger and he has to, I don't have to go into the details, but he has to sell his daughter again and again to keep getting money to buy food. So it becomes sort of a parable um, in Ovid of this idea of insatiable, excessive, overreaching, overstepping. Um, something that the Greeks in the mythical tradition like this, but also in the philosophical tradition, were very, very keen to address. And that's part of the premise of what, um, what I'm getting at, that there's this uh, intellectual heritage um, about about sustainability um, that, that the Greeks um, exhibit. So here's a summary. Um, actually, I'm gonna get ready for later here. So uh, there's a deep-rooted sensitivity in prehistoric and pre-industrialized societies to sustainable living. This is due to necessity, survival, common interest, which is reinforced by cultural norms, practices, and reflected in ancient narratives like the myths we've just been talking about. Really our only access to them for the Greeks, though we can reconstruct many of these things through comparative studies with living traditional cultures, fewer and far further between these days, but you know, hunting gathering societies in sub-Saharan Africa or you know, uh, New Zealand, I mean, uh, New Guinea Highlanders or, or whatever. All right, um, now, okay, here's, this is, this is a moment of transition. So this is, the, this is the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. I didn't take the picture, but I've been there. And it is just as magnificent as that. Um, on the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, where the Oracle of Apollo resided, two things were inscribed in Greek, Gnothi Seoton and Meden Agon. 
The first one means know thyself. The second one means nothing in excess. Now, these things are often because we see things from the vantage point of all that has, su had su has sub subsequently been written by Greek authors about them. We tend to see them as sort of like philosophic statements, like um, know thyself in some sort of existential way, right? Or nothing in excess um, made in agon, sort of the Aristotelian definition of virtue as the mean between excess and defect, right? Um, but really, you know, I, I'm, 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 they, they were inscribed there long, long before philosophy ever, you know, raised its ugly head or dawned on the rest of the world. Um, these things are, are maxims, very proverbial Wolfgang <laughs> maxims that talk about know thyself, meaning know your place in the world, know where you belong, don't overstep it, know it. The other one also, nothing in excess. Um, very just generic proverbial rather than the sort of philosophized, philosophized version that Aristotle gives us. Okay, um, so the reason why I have that slide there is because we're moving from sort of mythic narratives and this idea of sustainability of m m observing limits um, uh, to a more philosophical take on it, which we have ample evidence for. And if I haven't said so already, this is, these are just snippets of this larger project. I mean, this is the first I've written down of it right here. You're looking at it. So this is all very provisional in the best sense. I'm looking forward. Um, and I'm, I'm not married to really any of it. But I do feel that one of the signal texts in any project about sustainability, complex systems, and the Greeks is Plato's Republic. So Plato um, has a passage in the Republic, for those of you who have read it, uh, or those who have not where he talks about the origins of cities, why cities come to be, right? And Plato, very quickly here, Plato's grand scheme in the Republic, right? He starts with, he wants to know what justice is. That's how the whole thing starts. What is justice? What's the definition of justice? First book tries to you know, raise that question, ends, um, oh gosh, shock of Bailey just walked in. Now I'm really in trouble. Uh, so uh, what justice is? But he's really, ultimately, Plato's interested in what it means to be just in oneself, one's psychological justice, some sort of, you know, uh, uh, what, what personhood is and in, in, in the soul, justice in the soul. But he doesn't start there. He starts with justice in society. He starts with the city. He argues, he says, you know, it'll, it'll be easier to read the fine print if we start with the big letters first. So there's a notion of a homology between the macrocosm of what a society is and then what the individual, what an individual should be within society is central to the whole architecture and progression of the argument of the Republic. So he's at that moment where he's talking about the origins of cities. And this is very interesting because he talks about like, you know, what uh, I, I say, by the way, I call it SimCity. <laughs> I don't know if ever, anybody's ever played this, this, this game before, but it's a game you can play and you can like create a city and pretend how it's going to work. And probably there's an interesting connection there to complex systems as well, because this idea of modeling and, and simulating is super important to see how things, quote unquote, play out. This is a thought experiment of a different sort um, you know, without, the mathema without the mathematical equations. So, um, so anyway, he says, come then, let's make a theoretical state from scratch. I think our need for it will build it for us. This notion of need, hey, hematere, crea, this, uh, again, needing one another and, and, and mutual um, uh, need is important to it. So then he goes on to you know, say what you need in it and you, know, uh, you need everyone doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and then hold on, what do I get down here? Um, I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but he's, he's, he's careful to note in the construction of this SimCity that it can't be too big because if it gets too big, it'll, it'll get out of hand and that could be a problem. But he does admit, and this is Plato's way of proceeding or Socrates' way of proceeding, um, does admit that it needs some things like, you know, wh whoops, wage earners and laborers. And then the question is, what is justice in the city? And then Glaucon's conclusion here is kind of, I think, important. Again, this I, notion of communitar communitarianism, as it were. Um, Glaucon says, I have no idea what, where, where justice is in such a city that we've just created theoretically, unless it is in the needs of those same people regarding their mutual interests. So this idea of uh, uh, cooperation and mutual interest important to Plato's city of uh, Sim City. Now, uh, here he describes the ideal city, uh, Socrates does. And 
what happens is, is that Glaucon de declares it to be a city for pigs. No human would want to live in this. This is too simple. This is too, uh, it's without all the things that we, we need, like uh, BMWs and you know, these things and those things and uh, whatever else. So what kind of life will the people uh, who have been provided for in this way, will they make anything other than food, wine, clothing, and shoes? And then he goes through another need of these other things. And then, um, and then he says they will be fed on barley meal, prepare for themselves, make flour from wheat, cook or knead some of it. Uh, serve excellent barley cakes, blah, blah, blah. So very uh, wholesome, very uh, close to nature, not too far from nature, not too far in the direction of culture. They will, but there is culture, they'll drink wine, they'll sing praises to the gods, living in harmony with each other, and not producing children beyond their means. Remarkable to me that Plato was quite aware of that um, um, in this theoretical city, probably based on real practical considerations from uh, real culture. Um, Okay, let's see what I want to talk about here. So um, Glaucon objects that n nobody wants to, nobody wants this kind of city. But but let me just let me just read what Plato, what what Socrates says. Um, uh, and the eye here is Socrates. So he's saying, well, Glaucon says you're, you're making people dine without you know relishes and condiments. Anu opsum, opsu. That's true. I said I forgot. We will have condiments, and then he gets a whole big list of things that'll make their food taste good. So there will be pleasure in the, in the city. Uh, they will roast myrtle berries and acorns in the ashes near the fire. It's probably a euphemism for sex. Um, and while they drink in moderation, so it seems they will spend their lives in peace and good health. They will reach old age, and this, this is key, um, and pass on to their successors a life just like this one. It's not going to be too big, and they're going to pass it down to their um, ancestors um, intact, or it's going to be sustainable, as in the uh, Brundtland report. Um, so anyway, Glaucon objects that this is this is not a, this is like not the city. Nobody wants to live in here. It's a city of pigs. It's a huopolis, is the Greek for that. And and Plato retorts, "Oh, you want one then that is luxurious, and you want one that is not the healthy one that I just described, the one that is quote unquote ideal in our theoretical SimCity game, but you want one that is inflamed or sick, feverish. Feverish is the typical way that's translated." Um, so the rest of the Republic unfolds as a way to deal with the fact that we have a feverish city. This is the city we live in. This is what we face. And so how to deal with it? Where is justice? What is justice in that context? So again, a signal text for me um, that I will revisit, no doubt, uh, more so. We can talk about this afterwards. So um, Socrates, uh, Plato was not Socrates' only disciple. Uh, he had many disciples. And in fact, Plato was probably the least representative of um, the Socraticism that Socrates practiced. I think the closest uh, analog or the closest disciples in spirit and maybe even in practice in some ways were the Cynics. And this is Diogenes the Cynic um, in his own hometown of Sinope uh, of a, uh, in, uh, on the Black Sea in, in modern Turkey. Uh, you see his lantern there looking for one good man in broad daylight. And you see his little dog. Cynic, by the way, for those who don't know, means dog, dog or dog-like. And they were called that because they did all their private business out, out in the open like dogs do. They don't, dogs don't care. And the cynics did this on purpose to make a statement. And that's, that's, really, that's really what I want to focus on here is just the notion of uh, the statement that they're trying to make. Um, and I'll cruise through this. I don't wanna, I'm going to have to give this shorter shrift. Um, so you have encounters uh, in the cynic tradition of you know, the, the cynic goal was this, to, to need as little as possible and to want even less than that, as they put it. So to need as little as possible, to want even less than that, to make do. And to deal with this, they, they practiced. They practiced. Uh, the word ascetic uh, comes, comes from the cynics. Askesis, or practice. It's a, wor a word that derives from the, the, world, the world of Greek athletics. And they, 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 they practiced more so these uh, to do without, um, so that they could do without when when pressed, when it came to when push came to shove, uh, and there there are some wonderful encounters on the on the world stage. They're probably fictional, but here's Diogenes living in his barrel, little dog, living out of doors. You know, he begged for a living. They did that. Um, they carried around their little staff and their cloak, and that was it. Um, and this is Alexander the Great, who has this you know encounter with him, and Alexander says. I'll do whatever I, you want. I, I have the world's power. I'll give you whatever you want. What do you want? And Diogenes, in a hippie sort of way, says, 
here, here in the Greek, uh, un undarken me or unshade me, please, meaning stand out of my light because there's, uh, uh, Alexander's in his way and all he wants is to do is bask in the light in front of his barrel. Uh, that's from a children's book I wrote on the same topic where Diogenes is cast as a dog. Again, I couldn't resist putting it in there. And you get the kind of GQ Alexander figure and it's even more explicit there. Get out of my light. Well, you know, what goes around comes around. And the more things change, the more they stay the same. I don't know if anybody knows of this character, Colin Bevan, a um, uh, self-promoter, as many cynics were. But um, he lived in, anybody heard of this guy? Perhaps, yeah. He lived in Manhattan in, a, in an apartment and chose to do without to kind of make a statement about sustainability. Um, put his wife through it, and she divorced him a few years later. Uh, no surprise. But, you know, uh, uh, no paper diapers. They composted in the apartment. They didn't have any electricity. Didn't ride a bike. This is the documentary film that, um, that uh, was the culmination of what started as a blog, a series of New Yorker, uh, uh, New York Times, excuse me, articles, and that's the man himself. And I think now he's a Green Party or progressive candidate, or maybe he won a seat in, in New York, uh, the New York uh, Senate or Congress, I'm not sure. But uh, no impact man. Um, so again, there's that. Um, I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time. This is, um, oh, I'm going to briefly talk about it, only this is a, um, a, a, pa this is a passage um, about a, uh, a cynic who was in the train of Alexander the Great when Alexander was conquering the world, going east. So uh, a Greek cynic was with him. He was an admiral, terrible admiral, probably not a very good cynic either, but he's in the story. And he goes out in quest of um, Eastern wisdom, a very typical motif in this kind of travel literature from antiquity novels. So he's, he's out for uh, this, this sort of uh, Eastern wisdom. And he meets up, this guy called, uh, meets up with these people called gymnosophists, which means naked philosophers. Um, and uh, one naked philosopher he meets up with says this, in the beginning the world teemed with wheat and barley, now it is made mostly of dirt. Once fountains yielded an abundance of water, milk, even honey, wine, and olive oil. But excess, blemosunes, self-indulgence, through phase, or echoes here with Plato's Republic, but that's just because that's what these words mean, only made men insolent. Es hubren exepezon hoi anthropoi. Um, so this notion, um, and then so in disgust of the state, Zeus took away these blessings and subject, subjected men to a life of labor. When self-restraint, sophrosune, or just you know, moderation, and other virtues developed, then opportunities for a good life reappeared. But greed and arrogance, you said, the words there are karos and uh, hubris. Karos means satiety, meaning having more than you need. Um, uh, once again, threatening man's existence, and at present there is a renewed risk of widespread devastation. Afanismos ton onton, which literally means, it doesn't mean widespread devastation, I should have changed that too. Uh, the disappearance of what is, <laughs> of what exists. So uh, here you have this encounter of arch radical sustainability <laughs> people in Greece, the, the cynics. Uh, encountering people who were even better than them in the East. Um, very typical thing. But the point that the, the author of this is, is trying to make, or this, uh, this encounter is trying to, to um, bring out, is this contrast here. So Mendanus is the gymnosophist that um, Onesicritus meets up with. His considered opinion was that the Greeks were sensible in most respects, but wrong to defer to custom over nature. So in other words, um, this notion of living according to nature, the, the Greeks erred on the side of deferring to custom. Big debate in antiquity, a huge debate. Are we are what we are by nurture, which is the Greek word namos, or are we are what we are by nature, phusis? We born that way, hardwired, are we acculturated to be that way? Um, that's not a new question. Levi Strauss didn't invent it. Um, it goes back to the Greeks too. But um, so anyway, there's, there's that. And then these are the modern gymnosophists, or they were the gymnosophists back then. These are sadhus from modern India, and that's, these are the, the characters that, were, that are described in this, um, in this episode. All right. Phase two, part two. What is a complex system? Um, one thing I'd like to just point out is that systems thinking and sustainability, uh, um, there, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they're sort of co-evil in some ways, at least in the, the popular imagination. They're both part of what the limits to growth, um, the result of the, re, uh, the, the, the Club at Rome report, 
they were talking about modeling a system which is sustainable, modeling it mathematically. I've been told, and I, I don't precisely care about it, but I, um, I've been told that their models, there are a lot of flaws with their models. You know, the, 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 the predictions that they make are not going, they, they, they don't hold water, and they're, they're flawed in that way. But the fact is, the idea of modeling something, um, mathematically in this case, and the notion of sustainability to be able to predict where we'll be, if we can be there in the future, uh, go together. So what is a complex system? Maggie teaches a course on this. I should probably just give you the wand that <laughs> you can take over. Well, this is a complex system. This is my 2000 Jetta TDI with over 300,000 miles on it. Um, it shows emergent properties every day, practically. Yes, the other day, the, uh, the thermostat didn't work. Um, uh, it's also a, sort of a conundrum of identity because I think, you know, like the ship of Theseus, like, you know, every part in this car except the engine has been replaced. So is it the same car that it once was? I mean, it's my car. I love it. It's my daily commuter from Shoreham. Um, I had the temerity to change over to my summer tires yesterday. We'll see if, what that was a, if that was a good idea. So that's a complex system, um, a car for sure, a used car. If you want to have a conversation afterwards about why I think used cars are sustainable, I'd love to have that conversation. Um, this is not a complex system. <laughs> this is chaos. Um, this is lambing in, in February, or January was a Caroline. January, um, at like 20 below zero or 15 below zero, really cold. Yes, we do lamb in January, so we can have lambs ready for the, the Easter market in the spring, uh, this, in the same spring as they're, they're born. Um, and I wish I had the soundtrack to this because you would, you would agree with me that it's chaos. It's just like sheer and utter cacophony when you sprinkle some grain for them and they come running. But anyway, that's chaos and not that. So uh, this um, assures me that, that at least talking about complex systems is not narrow and not you know, specialized. It's reached the popular imagination for sure. This is from last week's New Yorker cartoon, we are being controlled by the random outcomes of a complex system. Um, the cartoon actually shows a misunderstanding, I think, of what a complex system is, um, because it's not always random. And even when you have chaos, as I understand it, there is a pattern. We're just not able to discern it. But patterns you know, within a complex system become important. OK, key features of complexity. A complex system is, and I'm just pirating this from various sources, probably not the best ones. Um, a network of interacting, uh, interacting objects or agents. It's more than the sum of its parts, and that's what's meant by it, ex it exhibits emergent properties. It's affected by memory or feedback, which can be leveraged to control it and change the behavior of a complex system, which is often what we want to do when a complex system is a little too close to chaos. It's self-regulating or cybernetic. Um, that's also important. It's a mix of disordered and ordered behavior, and it's dynamic and evolutionary. And you know, I admit to being dependent on this is Donella Meadows, um, Dana Meadows' subsequent sort of textbook um, on this thinking in systems, and she's the one that was responsible for the limits to growth report. And also this Neil Johnson, not to be confused with Stephen Johnson, who wrote a book on emergence. He's the tech journalist guy. This guy is a physicist at the University of Miami. So I believe him for the most part, or at least. Um. OK, so Johnson gives an example of what do I want to do here. Again, I'm tracing the genealogy of ideas, modern ideas about sustainability and complexity back to the Greeks. Right? Um, and I just see, I see a lot of parallels. Some of them may be phenotypical, but I think some of those parallels are rooted in sort of like a, a, sort of a cultural DNA. Um, so this is Johnson, and he's talking, he's given an example about what a complex system is. And, he, and he's talking, he's, he's segueing from this, this, this discussion of keeping a ruler balanced upright on one's finger. And he, and he talks about how, you know, that can be quantified, the, the energy that goes into that, and, and how it operates, and, and predictability of how long it's going to be able to stay, the ruler's going to be able to stay upright while you move, move your finger around. But then he gives this, uh, he responds with this analogy. The energy which we, we use to create the feedback loop to keep that ruler in place for the ruler comes from the food we eat. Uh, and the food we eat, and this is, all right, this is what he says. And the food we eat 
can be traced back to plants. This is even true for meat and dairy products. They come from animals who themselves ate plants. So it all comes down to plants. And plants get their energy from that great energy source in the sky, the sun. He capitalizes it. In other words, the sun represents the root cause of the pockets of order that we observe around us. All right, true enough. I mean, I don't think you have to be an advanced theoretical physicist to, to know this. This is actually quite a deep statement, he says, since it means that the sun is what helps us buck the general trend from order to disorder. This is even true when we build buildings or create other ordered structures using machines and materials such as concrete. Why? Because machines are made of metal and run on gasoline. And gasoline, metal, concrete all originate from the natural resources found on Earth. And those in turn owe their existence to the solar system and hence the sun. Um, I think some of you know where I'm probably going with this. He also says, I won't, you don't know yet because I haven't shown it. But this is another thing he says about, oh, I'm going to skip that slide. Um, this is where I was going, um, to Plato. Famously in the Republic, Plato talks about the sun as being the offspring of the good, the source of all we see around us, the source of being able to see it, but not the good in and of itself. Uh, it's the offspring of the good. And you know, I don't have to read this. Uh, most people are familiar with, the, with, if you've read the Republic even in you know, whatever, you know, your, old, your old college days, this is a major, major analogy that Plato makes for the way the world works and for what justice is and for what society is and for what, what psychological justice, justice of the soul, is all about. Um, yeah, and then he, he talks about it being responsible for all these things. He talks about it being the origin. And he uses uh, metaphors of parturition, tecusa, giving birth to, you know, ekonos, takos. Um, this is all, you know, biological and, um, and, uh, and again, here's, he didn't have the math to do it or, or didn't need it. He, he saw it around him. Okay, that, let's pause that. The reason why I put those slides up there was that, you know, Johnson had no clue. He had no clue that this has been a, a long, an age-old analogy um, from culture. Um, he thinks he's inventing it, but it happens to be, you know, uh, true in terms of the physics of it, too, the sun being... Um, responsible for pockets of order in what could be complete disorder. All right, so Anaximander of Miletus. Anaximander was one of what we call the pre-Socratics, um, an early quote-unquote natural philosopher. Um, he was the student of Thales, um, um, and, and Miletus is on the coast of Asia Minor. And um, he was in a marvelous, he, he, uh, he is described in a marvelous essay by um, Carlo Rovelli uh, as the first scientist. Um, and I think you'll see why, and, and I think he's important to me too for this project on complexity um, for several reasons. Um, I'll read this because this contains this. He was the author of the first prose book that we have um, at all. We don't have it, <laughs> that, that we know of from antiquity. So Anaximander is the first prose author so far as we know. And he, his, the name of his, his work was called Perifuseos, physics, or on nature, uh, to put it another way. So of those that say the universe is one, moving, and infinite, Anaximander, son of Praxides, a Milesian, this is a report of Theophrastus, from Theophrastus. The successor and pupil of Thales said that the principle and element of existing things was the aperon. Ta aperon in Greek, ta aperon, means boundless. It can mean, it's disputed exactly what Anaximander meant by it, but boundless, indefinite, uh, infinite, undifferentiated. Being the first to introduce this name for the first principle, arche, chief undertaking of the pre-Socratics was to find some fundament of life of, of the world. What, did, what is the basis, the first principle, uh, or what is the thing that makes everything else work in the world? Um, usually a physical property. For Thales, it was water. You know? um, but interestingly enough, for, for an Aximander, it's, it's a concept. It's, a, it's maybe the concept of space or empty space, ta aperon, the boundless. All right, he says it's neither water nor any other so-called elements, but some other operon nature, from which come into being all the heavens and the world in them. So it uh, has a progenitor um, quality. And the origin, genesis, of existing things is that into which destruction too takes place. So there's some sort of reciprocal 
interaction, dynamical system between destruction and creation. According to, and this is a quotation from his work, according to necessity, for they pay penalty and retribution to each other for their injustice, according to the order of time, as he describes it in rather poetical words. So the quotation marks around there preserve what we're confident because of the dialectical forms there that, um, th that, that comes from an axiom, that's a quotation from an Aximander's book. Um, and it's the only verbatim quotation that we have. <laughs> Sorry, so I'm, I'm probably pinning a lot on one, one fragment. You can fault me for that later. All right, so how do I see this working with complexity? All right, well, let me first give you uh, a notion of Anaximander's cybernetic universe, uncreated universe, right? That this, there's no invisible hand making it work, a key element to complex systems and to the world as we actually know it properly described in terms of modern theoretical physics. Um, he describes, this is how he's, he's, he's presented as describing the origin of the world. I'm not, again, I'm not putting too much on this. I'm putting Big Bang in, in parentheses and in quotation marks and also origin of species in co co uh, quotation marks. But basically, he views the eternal productive element of hot and cold were separated off at the origin of this world and a kind of ball of flame grew around the air that surrounds the earth like bark around a tree. Okay, interesting, but no God is saying fiat lux. You know, there's something, there's, there's a naturalistic explanation for how this is coming about. It, it is cybernetic, uncreated. The origin of species, this is really quite wonderful, and he's actually surprisingly right, and you've got to wonder, you know, empirically, does he just observe this and intuit this from, from empirical observation, because they didn't experiment at this point. Biological life, this is, again, we have this in paraphrase from others, arises from moisture and slime by the application of heat from the sun. Men evolve from fish, wow, uh, which over time emerge from the sea onto dry land. We can talk more about that later if you want. Okay, this is where I really get into trouble. All right, and I have a, yeah, we'll see. All right, <coughs> complex systems, oh boy, Maggie, I'm really nervous. Complex systems. Um, utilize a version of one particular equation, um, equation to talk about um, the, uh, the change in a system over time. And it is, it is this thing called a logistic map. And I don't even know why it's called a logistic map. It's also called an output time series. And that, that makes more sense to me, actually. I don't know why it's called a logistic map. But the logistic map or output time series illustrates mathematically how complex and chaotic behavior can arise from very simple nonlinear dynamical equations. Here's like a standard version of that, of that equation where R is the rate of growth and that's the actual most important thing that we're going to be talking about. The changing of the value of R in this equation or in real life, not just the equation, in, in a dynamical complex system changes significantly, even a small change, changes significantly the behavior of the system as a whole. Oh, I don't, uh, th here's a, uh, I, I have this courtesy of um, Sam Darbyshire from King's College London who loves this stuff and, you know, and this is not esoteric knowledge, this is widespread knowledge among complex systems people. But um, you, you see that th there's a very small change in that R value results in very, very different behaviors. So like if you, if you make R 3 point, that number, <laughs> um, you get permanent oscillations between two values. If, if, if the number is between that and that, that's a pretty small difference, at least to untutored me, you get permanent oscillations among four values, right? If R is, increases beyond this, you get period doubling bifurcation. Uh, but then the difference between that and that is so small you get the onset of chaos at that point. And Maggie Epstein was so good to me to show me how this works graphically and visually because that helps me a lot. Um, this is not her, her um, oh, how do I do this? Her diagram, but you can see visually how this happens when it's, when, um, the, uh, when it's graphed onto um, an xy coordinates with a parabola. So um, the r value is up in the upper left hand corner. Um, and this is just for fun. So this is all ordered behavior, a little less ordered. <laughs> and then when r approaches 4, it becomes 
chaotic or defined as chaotic. But again, I'm told, and mathematicians in the room can, can uh, expound on this, that even chaotic behavior um, can be, th there is a pattern to it. It's just uh, beyond, sometimes beyond recognition, beyond being able to identify it. All right, let's get out of that slide before I get into real trouble. And speaking of being in trouble, I know I'm in trouble because um, when you have a prepared statement, which I do, I have a prepared statement on this topic about an anaximander, I'm going to read it to you, but um, you know, somebody's in trouble and they have that. All right, Anaximander speaks of the reciprocal, and this is where, I, this is the moment, this is the point I'm trying to make. Anaximander speaks of the reciprocal calibration of elemental opposites over time. As he puts it, they pay the penalty one to another for their injustice. Okay, granted, a metaphor from the political world talking about it as injustice, but that's actually interesting. Um, according to the ordering of time, in Greek that's kai tu, kai ten tu kronu taxon. System scientists working in nonlinear dynamics speak of arrangements of objects or the output of their interaction over time. Those same components are adumbrated in, in Anaximander's statement where the, the word toxin means arrangement or order, chronu is time, i.e. the R value of, a, of the logistic map, and tokreon necessity um, is, quote unquote, the necessity expressed in Greek as necessity, a natural or mathematical law. So. Um, I'm not suggesting that Anaximander knew the logistic map, but I'm suggesting that he understood and was sensitive to the importance of time as an element of change. That's, that's the key point. So a periodic time series, i.e. period doubling bifurcation, yields fractals, you probably have seen these, um, described by Johnson as a typical emergent phenomenon in complex systems. Fractals represent states that are not too ordered and not too disordered. In Johnson's words, and this is important, the upshot is that there is indeed a type of universal pattern of life lying somewhere in the middle ground between completely ordered patterns and completely disordered patterns. Fractals comprise a mathematical description of phenomena and characterize not only things in nature, i.e. the contours of mountain ranges and coastlines, the human heartbeat, I heard that that's debated though, uh, but also it has been shown products of culture like city skylines and modern jazz music. Um, studies on that. I read an interesting article on jazz. Anaximander seems to have recognized some such systematic self-regulatory principle in nature, though of course he did not and could not explain, describe it mathematically. I'll leave, I'll leave that for consideration later. But I, uh, that's the nature of my thinking about why Anax Anaximander might be important for this project. Heraclitus. This is going to be difficult. Um, you know, I'm almost tempted. I'm almost tempted to not talk about Heraclitus. Look how many slides there are. That would be that would leave me in trouble. Um, Heraclitus is also important for this project for a number of reasons. Let me just paraphrase it. Um, Heraclitus was also an ancient physicist. His book was called Parafuseos. We don't have it all, but we have substantial fragments. He wrote in a very riddling style. Think uh, Nietzsche in Ionic Greek, um, but but his observation. But he did this on purpose because the observations he was making about um, the natural world and the nature of reality um, were were paradoxical. Um, and um, he he talks about um, a self-regulatory system. In fact, I want to go to one slide, and it's it's this one because it features, all right, Heraclitus used the bow um, and the lyre as an example of um, the, kind of, um, the kind of thing that makes the world work. And he called that kind of thing harmonia, uh, or, or word harmony. It comes from a Greek root word that means to put together from our uh, old Indo-European root, our, our arisco, there's a whole bunch of them. The word Homer might be related to it. Um, so this is what he says, and this is the only fragment I'll, I'll talk about here. Um, so he says, this is a quote from uh, Heraclitus. They do not apprehend, they being the unwashed masses, um, how being at variance, it agrees with itself. Literally, how being brought apart, it is brought together. And the it there is the nature of reality, the structure of, of the world. Um, 
Oh, and I just, that's a point I make uh, about noting the correspondence with another fragment that he has. Um, there is a backstretched connection, and the word connection there is harmonia, um, as in the bow and the lyre. And I, I wanna, wanted to put this slide up here because I get to, I get to uh, brag about my colleague, John Franklin, who wrote an astounding paper, and I don't say that lightly, a really killer paper on this topic um, called Harmony in Greek and Indo-Iranian Cosmology for the Indo Journal of Indo-European Studies. So um, for Heraclitus, comparing the bow to the lyre, both the bow and the lyre are, as it were, a complex system that f form a feedback loop a circularity of the under tension. So both ends of the bow are under tension by a string. It contains potential energy that if activated can, can do things. Um, so it can show quote unquote emergent properties. This is what John says about it. The living bow, and I just point out that in Heraclitus he has another, uh, another axiom or another fragment that uh, says that the bow's name, bios, with the accent on the last syllable, is life, bios, accent on the first syllable, but its work is death. Again, typical paradox, but the idea that the bow, that the result, the sum total is greater, th uh, the result is more than the sum of its parts. You know, the, the bow's name is life, but it produces death. So um, the living bow, says uh, John, was a very simple, ancient, and striking example of a transcendent whole, the parts of which are caught in a continuous circular interplay mutually causing what has been called in whole systems theory and quote unquote emergent property. And here he's, he's quoting uh, Fritjof Capra's The Web of Life, I think John is. Um, but this notion of palintropos, a thing turning back on itself um, is important. Um, and I think is akin to the, the notion of a complex system's tendency to be self-regulating self and cybernetic um, and self-sufficient with no invisible hand. All right, I think I'm, oh, I think I'm gonna pause there because I do wanna have time for questions or comments. Um, there's one rule for questions and comments, for the, and that is you can't ask me a question about math or physics, but you may make a comment about math or physics for my edification. Thank you. <laughs>